My name is uh, Christopher Bailey and I'm the Arts and Health Lead at the World Health Organization. And thank you for coming to the first of a series of moderated conversations from uh, UN 75, celebrating the first 75 years of the UN's history. Um, this uh, program is brought to you by Culture Runners, by the World Council of Peoples for the United Nations and UN 75. And our idea in marking this anniversary is rather than looking back on the history of the UN, to engage the cultural and artistic community on looking forward and, and having discussions on the great issues of our times and what the, the culture and art, artistic community have to say about the way forward. Um, what I'm going to do uh, now, oh, by the way, I want to remind you that if you're tuning in on YouTube, uh, you can, in the comment section, put questions. And when we're done with our initial round of conversations, we're going to feed those questions uh, to our panelists. Um, in this first section, uh, we are going to briefly introduce ourselves, uh, say who we are, what we do, and where we are as well. And I'll kick off. I mentioned that I'm the Arts and Health Lead at the World Health Organization. Uh, you might wonder what that is at the World Health Organization. Well, we do a lot of things. Uh, everything from the Lady Gaga concert that you saw last weekend to a network of grassroots painters and artists that we've put together that we call the Solidarity Shows to fight COVID that I'm doing in collaboration with a group uh, called Create 2030. Uh, and uh, to the research agenda, we have a, a report that came out last November from our Copenhagen office on the evidence base for the health benefits of the arts to working with groups on the ground, using arts, using song, using jokes, using um, theater to build community, to, to reinforce health messaging, to make, to encourage a greater sense of well-being. So where am I? I'm in Geneva in my home. Uh, you can see behind me uh, a painting that was painted by my father of my two sons. Uh, I, I grew up in a very artistic household, so it, it feels like home to me. Um, and that's probably enough about me. Let's, let's move over to uh, our panel. Uh, Anne, would you like to describe uh, who you are, what you are, where you are? Thank you, Chris, and thank you for having me. And I should just start with saying that I, I hope everybody who's tuning in uh, is healthy, that you and yours are all well and uh, doing your very best to, um, to be thriving in this moment. So um, I'm Ann Pasternak. I'm the lucky gal that gets to be the director of uh, the Brooklyn Museum, a nearly uh, 200 year old institution. And it's awesome. If you haven't been, you must come visit. Uh, and right now I'm not at the museum. I'm working out of my bedroom uh, in my lake cottage an hour outside of New York City. And behind me, I have vintage paintings. I also have paintings, Chris, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, uh, lake landscapes harking back maybe to more naive times when people had more idealistic views of nature than we do today on this uh, annual Earth Day. Well, that's just wonderful, Anne. And may I say, uh, my kids grew up in Brooklyn and the Brooklyn Museum was the second home to us. Uh, we love that place. Uh, so, uh, Jerry, uh, who are you, what are you, and where are you? Who am I? Uh, thank you, Christopher, and thank you, thank you, thank you, WHO. You really are saving the world along with UN. Thank God for you. That's all we can all say. Thank God. Well, very kind of you. Thank you. Um, so I'm an art critic, so you can immediately start not liking me. Uh, although I was a long distance truck driver for 10 years, the only Jewish one, I think, out on the roads I was traveling, and I have no degrees, so you don't have to listen to me. And I didn't start being an art critic till I was about 40 years old. So if you think you're a big loser, bigger, much bigger. Um, <laughs> 
my wife and I, my wife is Roberta Smith, the uh, co-chief art critic for the New York Times, who I think is the best critic alive, but I'm biased. We are about an hour and a half north of New York City in the sort of groomed poodle of Connecticut, where we rent a house. Um, and all I do in this office that I work across from her is I'm trying to work harder than I ever have and take my work deeper than it has ever been, even if I fail it. What's in back of me, I'm not sure if you can see it. If you can see this black and white picture, that is Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa in the middle of the Second World War. And as my talisman, it is there to remind me that once upon a time when the world was terrified of losing it all, it would even pack great sculpture in great gobs of plaster to try to save it. And that this too can be saved. Oh, Thank that's, you. That's just lovely, Jerry. And uh, it, it is a message of, of hope and preservation. Uh, and picking up our interrupted dreams. Uh, Mona, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, who you are, what you are, and where you are? Of course, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Mona Chalabi. I am the data editor of The Guardian US. Um, I'm currently in Brooklyn, um, which isn't as scary as it sounds for me, at least, because of uh, multiple forms of privilege, I guess. Um, uh, but it is still a little bit scary, um, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I also want to echo what Anne was saying about hoping that everyone who's listening in is, is safe and well. And what Jerry said about a deep and profound respect for the World Health Organization, the work that you do makes the work that I do so much easier um, when I'm trying to navigate through the data sets that come from different countries to have one repository that I can go to, when I'm trying to navigate the different advice that comes from different governments that might have their own particular objectives in terms of the safety advice that they're issuing right now, to have one resource that isn't motivated by, say, um, economics in quite the same way when issuing health advice is really, really important right now, so thank you. Oh, well, well, thank you. You're referring, of course, to the World Health Observatory, which uh, my friend uh, Philippe Boucher uh, was, was running. Um, that's a, a wonderful asset. And, and may I say, you are uh, a woman after my own heart, uh, trying to take data and make it come alive for people. Uh, it's, it's a real gift and it's a real blessing. Thank you. And thank to, thanks all of you for your words of appreciation to WHO. Uh, we are, uh, doing our best in a difficult situation. We face these things before, but I, I would like to remind people that uh, the World Health Organization is, is you. Um, it, member states make, make it up. Uh, our, our, you know, everyone in the world is, is our, our bosses and our clients. Uh, so um, we're all in this together. Uh, the next few minutes, I, I'm gonna try and uh, frame the discussion a little bit, and I promise you it'll be the most that you hear from me. Uh, I'll, I'll let the uh, more intelligent and creative experts uh, uh, follow, uh, take over. But I did want to try and uh, see a few words to put this discussion into context. And I was thinking about the 75th anniversary of the UN and that terrible cataclysm that made the UN necessary, mainly World War II. And I began to think, you know, if I had to describe to my sons what World War II was about, <clears throat> in some ways it was a struggle about the lie of division. We had an ethos that had emerged called fascism that decided that the superficial differences between people, your race, your religion, your nationality, your the language that you spoke, uh, your sexual preference, uh, whether you were disabled or not, um, somehow mark you for what level of rights you would receive in your society or even that fundamental right to exist at all. 
And when that terrible conflict was over at a great price and the world was exhausted, there was a vision of a better future. And by mutual agreement, the peoples of the world came together and decided that we were one species living on one planet. And more importantly, we were the joint caretakers of that planet and of each other. And that became the UN. Now, along with that vision came terrible anxieties with the atomic age and, and artists had a huge role to play uh, subtly and directly. Everything from the, the writings of Arthur Miller to the paintings of Jackson Pollock to Hollywood film noir it, it expressing the anxiety of the time. And, and artists have always in these moments of history formed a purpose of trying to make sense of those anxieties and help navigate uh, us as a community to, to move forward in a positive way. Um, and we're facing right now with COVID-19, another marker in that history, an overturning. This pandemic is the first pandemic that we have faced as a people in a century. And although it probably doesn't have the same kind of existential um, urgency as uh, World War II or uh, other um, existential threats in the past, arguably it is a harbinger of other existential threats to come with the environment. Because we know these new diseases come from the animal world. We know that 60% of new diseases that affect the human biome come from the animal world, and that's caused more often than not through mismanaged practices in the food system, uh, deforestation, climate change. So we do know from the science that as terrible as this situation is, it won't be the last until we start changing our behavior. Um, so what do artists, what role do they have to play uh, in, in, in trying to make sense of this? I think that artists with their incredible gifts of, of empathy and trying to imagine what is not there have, have an essential role to play when, when we know that the world of pre-COVID is gone, the door has shut, we've entered a new room. We cannot go back. So to try and imagine what that new world would be and to try and navigate it is an essential role for artists. I also think that it's particularly heartbreaking because many artists out there are in that group that are most severely affected by the economic consequences of, of this disease. Uh, more often than not, artists do not have salary positions, they don't have health insurance, and yet still we've seen them come forward and donate their time. Um, so I guess my question to the panelists to start us off is how has this pandemic affected you, affected your community, and what is the role of artists moving forward, and, and, and what is that vision of the future? And the great thing about being moderator is that I don't have to answer that question. I can leave it up to you guys. Uh, so why, why don't we begin with uh, Jerry. Um, Jerry, what, um, how, how has this pandemic affected your world, you personally and the people around you? And, and, and what role uh, do you see uh, the artistic community having in the future? How is that world changing? The world that we left 30 days ago, 90 days ago, in many ways, that world is gone. In many, many other ways, it's still with us. Art has been with us since the caves. Creativity is in every bone in our bodies. It's a survival mechanism. What's astonishing about this is art 
thrives under the exact conditions that most of the billions of people of Earth are now living under, which is under pressure in smaller spaces in more intimate settings. What this means is all of us are working in a small room and over there, somebody's cooking. Over here, the kids are running around going nuts. Back there, Nana is walking around and your lousy dog keeps tipping over everything and wants to go out and you don't know what it's doing. But it turns out that is exactly how 99% of all the things that we've produced in the last 75,000 years were produced. And that all of the bloat, good and bad, it was a beautiful art world. I helped build it with 10 million other people. We all had little teeny roles to play. Art is no more or no less important than psychology, religion, uh, philosophy. It's not the decorative hedge in front of the citadel of knowledge, Chris. It's, mm. it's part of the whole ball of wax. And art is not gonna go away until all of the problems it was invented to solve and address have been solved and addressed. Even though we pronounce it dead once about every 15 years, we love to act like morticians and undertakers, but art has never not been with us and it's here now. The king is dead, long live the king, eh? Right. Yeah. So um, I, I guess, you know, oftentimes when we think of art, we think of objects, we think of a painting, a statue, a pot, uh, uh, you know, um, and, and with social distancing, with uh, sheltering at home, we're, we're separated uh, from those objects, we're separated from the touch of the people we love. Um, is, is that going to change our conception of art? I, I, in my mind, I have this image of, you know, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, where they burned the books and everyone had to memorize them. You know, uh, uh, you know that's science fiction. Um, but do, do we see the shift to the digital as, as something that this process is accelerating? It's a beautiful question. It's just beautiful because the operating system of art probably the best we've ever evolved to explore consciousness, the invisible, the only way to portray hell. You cannot take a picture of that, for example, or heaven. Um, as I say, it's been with us since the beginning. And now we have this other tool where right here is the entire known history of the universe in my pocket. How can that not help be a tool? It's not a problem that people say, get off your screen. More people are reading and writing today in this one day than have ever written or read before in the history of the world. We don't have to be obsessed with the 1% of the 1% of the 1% of all artists who make a lot of money. The unfortunate thing about the art world that we just left is people only saw it through the money, but the objects that are made, that are loved, art is not a noun, it's a verb. Art is something that does something to you. The Venus of Willendorf, that little, tiny sculpture found from about 40,000 years ago. So it's new. Um, I surmise was made by women. The stone is softer. The tools are very simple as a fertility uh, talisman to get pregnant or to stop getting pregnant. We know that art is for casting spells, for protecting armies, the sign of the cross was dreamt one night 
And then they put them on all the crosses in a big battle uh, over in modern Turkey. Um, art offers prayer. It isn't just something that sits there on the wall that people with lots of money get to buy. It's, it's a lot of things and it will continue being so many things. I promise you the content of now is in your work even if you paint stripes or watercolors or paint an old man's bald face, I'm sorry, I'm gaining weight in this. My refrigerator <laughs> knows my first name, rookie mistake. Well, can I tell you, Jerry, that as someone who is visually impaired, you look beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You're making my day. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, one of the things as you were talking that occurred to me is, is uh, you know, all of these illusions of our society, these, these constructs of, um, of, of difference, uh, um, in some ways, this virus, uh, which is the simplest and most elemental um, you know, organism uh, on the planet, has, has cut through uh, a, a lot of these illusions. Um, we, we talk about the commodification of art. Well, this virus, has destroyed our construct of economy, at least temporarily. You know, this virus doesn't recognize national borders. This virus doesn't care about your opinion. It follows nature's laws. It doesn't care if you have money or, or not money. Uh, and, but one of the things that the virus has not been able to destroy is the relationships between people, the creativity. Yeah, you know, and so that does make me wonder if that is not an indestructible, you know, conception of, of humanity. I love just, go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, sorry, please. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I, I, I would just add that I think in addition to um, demolishing the illusion of difference in some places, I think it's also highlighted very real differences that do exist in people's lives. So for example, we know that the, we know that the, um, the potential damage that this virus can do does vary by, by income lines, by race lines. It's extraordinary to look at the side-by-side -side maps um, in just New York, where I am, even it just in Brooklyn, neighborhood by neighborhood, looking at wealth and looking at the number of people that have died from this virus. Um, and I, I think that's really, really profound. And actually to add to um, everything you were saying with respect to the art world, I think, there are really, really exciting opportunities. I think it's strange because they're opportunities that I think none of us wanted to have this way, but I think there are opportunities to create an art world that is hopefully more accessible. I think the only thing that I would caution against that is if the future looks more digital, I don't necessarily think that means that accessibility is done and dusted. I think that um, physical spaces really, really matter. And I would also say that something that we forget so easily in this country is that not everyone even has access to the internet. Like even given what is happening right now, yeah. again, there are kids who aren't able to go to school, but also don't, can't afford a laptop at home. So they're still not able to get an education in the way that their, their more privileged peers are able to. And I think that's really, really important to keep in mind that even the people who are watching this right now might not necessarily be indicative of everyone who might have an interest in the art world. Spiel Weiber, sorry. Oh, I, I, Thank you for that. I, I think that's, that's, that's wonderful, Mona. Uh, I would like to underline one thing you touched on, and that's the, um, the inequities uh, mm -hmm. of the population and making certain parts of the population more vulnerable to this disease. Uh, in a way, um, that also emphasizes the illusion of difference, because um, if we decide that as wealthy, privileged people, that uh, uh, the the people who cannot afford health care, um, uh, you know, do not deserve our help, you know, the fact is that virus doesn't care about that difference. And if that poor person uh, who can't afford health insurance gets sick, that rich person becomes in greater danger. You know, that the chain of human health is only as strong as its weakest link. So it, it wipes out, you know, a, a hierarchical conception of economy. You know, we are truly all in this together. And I, I think strength 
establishing the health system, establishing health as a human right is, is essential to move forward. Um, Anne, were you uh, going to say something? No, Mona got it. Thank you. Oh, okay. Terrific. Right. Well, let me, let, me, let me go back to Jerry uh, a little bit and ask him. Um, the, uh, in, in terms of uh, the, I talked a little bit about uh, health system strengthening, which uh, is, is a bit of an obsession for those of us at WHO. So forgive me, you know, it's like, you know, asking the grave digger in Hamlet what Hamlet's about. He's going to say it's about this grave digger, right? <laughs> um, in, in terms of um, the way forward uh, for the art world and its connection to the environment, um, we do know that our actions impact the environment which impacts our health. That is, it is a delicate system. Um, what about the role that artists play in terms of environmental sustainability? Is, is there um, uh, an area of exploration there? Um, and, and, and what are the responsibilities of the artistic community in terms of uh, environmental sustainability? Chris, I guess I'm thinking about how the virus, you were talking about whole systems, has in like uh, computers, for example, and they expose what's already weak or already rotten. Right. Um, what's happening now is that the beautiful art world that was flawed and had gotten very insular, even though it was completely open, it also was for a clique of certain people. One thing that we know going forward is that an infrastructure of comfort needs to be maintained, an infrastructure of compassion, an infrastructure of connectivity, of communality, of cross-sectionality. The beautiful art world that was built was built more about, mm, let's not lie, individualism single voices working in single places at single times. So mainly white men would be the ones with the voice. Um, this virus has exposed that. Not that we did not know it and we're not taking steps to change it, but you better believe everyone listening to this and then I'll shut up is being tasked with an extraordinary thing, which is in 24 months, 48 months, whenever each of us starts venturing out into this new normal world, there are hundreds of thousands of new uniforms to be filled and roles to play. And you are the leaders. I once built an art world when I was your age. And it was okay for a while until it wasn't. But you are going to build a new world. I promise you. And you're going to be in charge. So, you know, just keep working, you big babies, with every spare minute and every spare dollar you've got. Get to the other side of this if you can. I'm trying. My wife and I are trying. And compromise situations medically. But if we do, we will take upon ourselves what we're all being tasked with and to take it ourselves, take it together this time. Well, that, that's just uh, wonderful, Jerry. You use the word uh, compassion, uh, which um, uh, is one of my favorite words. And mm. I think people sometimes misunderstand the word because they confuse it with empathy. Empathy is feeling what somebody else is feeling. Compassion comes from the Latin root meaning struggle together. And it's, mm. it's finding common cause with someone else. Their suffering is your suffering, like the South African concept of Ubuntu. Uh, and that's, uh, um, I, I think you pictured it quite beautifully. I, I'd like to um, turn the conversation over to uh, Anne a little bit and, uh, and, and, and talk to her uh, about um, 
the role art in the public space, such as mm. museums, but doesn't necessarily have to be a museum, have in terms of building community. Um, we, we, we've seen communities all over the world, um, you know, struggle with this epidemic. Uh, they are grieving for loved ones. They're anxious about their future. Um, uh, they um, are trying to make sense of contradictory information, misinformation. Um, what, what do museums and, and public art um, have, a, what role do they play in, in trying to bring the community together? Thanks, Chris. And I think that's a great question. You know, um, people I think sometimes take for uh, granted or don't even realize the important role cultural institutions play as places for gathering. So even though we have social distancing now, and some of us may have social hesitation to even go into, uh, you know, uh, cultural institutions or you know arenas, whatever it's sh shops, bars, restaurants, whatever it may be, um, a museum space or a cultural institution is a place where we can gather, where we can learn about history, where we're exposed to um, artists who are reflecting on our past telling us about our shared humanity and our shared uh, civilizations. Uh, and, and there are places to, at, at moments of crisis and tragedy, to come together for healing and remembrance and uh, release of, of, of pain and grief. And you know there are not that many public spaces where you can stand next to a stranger and have a conversation about history and how civilization has rallied. Um, where else are you going to do that? So I think that cultural institutions and museums in particular play an incredibly important role. I feel quite optimistic, even with social distancing, even with social hesitation, that people are going to want to come back to their museums. They're going to want to find solace in history. And they're want, going to want to see how artists today are responding to this moment, how they're helping us see, how they're reflecting our own experiences, our own truths, and how they're going to help us imagine a more just and generous and decent future. So I think the role of art and art institutions is extremely important moving forward. And I have to say that I've been very blessed in my life to have experienced this over and over again, whether it was working on the memorial after 9-11 in lower Manhattan called the Tribute in Light, or uh, working in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina with uh, Waiting for Godot uh, in New Orleans or at the museum working on shows related to issues of uh, racial equity like Soul of a Nation or We Wanted a Revelation, uh, Revolution and you know there's so you know Legacy of Lynching there's so many shows that we do uh, on a monthly basis that really reflect the truths the pains and the hopes and aspirations of our audiences and it feels good. It feels yeah. good to be truth tellers and to, uh, to, to see people. So, I think and, oh, sorry, go ahead, oh, Chris. Please go ahead, Mona. I was just gonna say that no, I think no, about say after, the, after the election uh, when it was a difficult day for many people and I went to the Brooklyn Museum and to arrive there and to be told on the spot that it was free today for anyone was like a really beautiful moment and speaking just showing how everything that Anne is saying is backed up by actions as well as words I guess. Thank you Mona. Yeah. <laughs> oh that, yeah indeed uh, I just want to remind the listeners out there who are tuning in live that they can uh, put down their questions and comments we already have a few um, I'm going to read out one question, but I'm not going to ask uh, you guys to answer it yet. We'll wait a few minutes because I, I want you to think about it because it's an important question to me. It's from Helena in Long Island. How can we support artists after the pandemic? Uh, hold that thought. We'll come back to it. But uh, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, now, Anne, you talked about uh, the our artistic uh, response after 9-11. You were referring to those two beams of light uh, that went up into the night sky. Um, uh, I just wanna say, uh, as a New Yorker who was an eyewitness of that moment, um, when I saw that, um, that piece, uh, it, it filled me with 
a wordless sense of grace. And uh, I, it, it was truly indescribable. And no offense to uh, Jerry and art critics who make their word trying to describe art. Uh, when you hit that moment where words fail, um, then you found something. And uh, I congratulate you and your colleagues on that crystallization of what we were all feeling and could not express. Um, and, and I think it was Carl Jung that once said, loneliness is not the absence of people. Loneliness is the inability to express what matters to you most. Mm. And that's the role of the artist. And that is what we're discovering in this time of home isolation uh, during the pandemic, uh, I, I think. So um, can you talk a little bit more, Anne, about specifically uh, what the Brooklyn Museum itself did. Now, I know you had an, uh, an exhibit uh, um, uh, that was medically related. Was that a coincidence uh, uh, recently? Um, and, 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 and what can the museum do if your doors are closed and nobody can actually come into the physical space uh, as the current situation is? What, what role do you have to play in this situation? Well, Chris, thank you. You know, I, I, I work with a team of people who care deeply about art as well as service. And so service is what we're thinking about a lot right now. So as soon as we closed, we tried to join relief efforts, which, you know, uh, you know, we're proud that we gave thousands of gloves over to the hospital workers, that we fired up our kitchen with our um, catering uh, partners and great performances, and we were providing 8,000 meals to hospital workers and seniors and senior citizen homes. And, you know, we have a task force of staff that volunteer to uh, help people who may need help getting to the pharmacy or groceries, whatever it may be. But I think it's really in looking at the longer term solutions uh, that I think will serve uh, people the most. You know, we've been spending a lot of time uh, talking to people, teachers, public school administrators, families, people who work with people with disabilities who are extremely isolated and really listening to the issues that they're facing and imagining how we may go even further than we already do in serving them in our uh, new COVID reality. And you know, we are already cutting back on exhibitions uh, so that we can make room for new kinds of programs, new kinds of services, new <laughs> kinds of projects uh, that will really respond to this moment. As much as we loved those other exhibitions and I still wanna see them happen. Um, you know, this isn't the first time in our nearly 200 year uh, history that the museum has been through crisis uh, from the civil war to World War II, from the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic to September 11th. We've been through crisis before, and I know that we'll get through this and that our community will need us to come out even stronger. And so our team is really committed to that. Question, Anne. Can uh, museums go broke? It scares me because I commune with the ancestors in your museum and others. Um, can a museum start to go broke in this pause? Absolutely. And I, and I fear about the closures of cultural institutions, small, medium, and large. And um, it's been great to see foundations come out and support small and medium-sized organizations, but I think they do forget about the large ones uh, that may also be at risk, those without great big endowments like ours. Um, uh, so that um, I think that this is a very critical moment for people to be aware of um, the potential um, severity of this crisis. And I, I have a question from Fabienne in the Isle of Man, which has to be the coolest geographical name in the entire Absolutely. world. Um, how can we reimagine museums and cultural institutions for them to become more inclusive spaces for a more diverse audience? Vivian, that is an excellent question, and I'm so glad you raised it because here in New York City, and I really think all over the country and um, even in, uh, throughout the world, especially in Europe as well, um, cultural institutions have been reckoning uh, with the fact they've been historically uh, speaking through one lens 
and programming through one lens and trying to connect with one particular audience in this case and you know in the United States with you know uh, white people I'm just going to name it and um, in the recent years there has been growing efforts to diversify staff diversify collections diversify programs but what we're seeing are massive layoffs among the cultural institutions and the first people to go are the people who are probably most likely on the fringes of uh, economic security already. Black and brown people, young people. And so the efforts to, um, to enhance diversity, equity, inclusion, and access within our institutions are going to be seriously challenged. And it calls on leaders like myself to be extremely careful in all the choices we're making about how we're going to reduce programming and who are we gonna end up serving, who are we privileging and who are we keeping on the team. Uh, so this is, this is an important moment for leaders to step up and think through a lens of equity. No, that, that's, that's very uh, uh, thoughtful and uh, it's, it's true in almost any field, isn't it? Um, yeah. That uh, uh, no matter where you go, uh, uh, oftentimes it, it is the vulnerable that uh, are the first to leave, you know, uh, groups that have been considered at least uh, vulnerable in a given society. Um, here's a question from Nicholas. For years, we have talked about the digital experience of art with projects like Google Cultural Institute and how do we experience art online? How relevant do you think this is now and moving forward? You know, Nicholas, I remember, you know, maybe it was 10 or 20 years ago, when you get older, time just sort of mushes together. And uh, it's a little bit like the pandemic that way, right? And yeah, I think uh, Einstein said something about that. Exactly. <laughs> so I remember everybody thought putting art online uh, was going to destroy audiences for institutions and galleries. And if anything, just the opposite was the reality. And so at the Brooklyn Museum, we've tried to pivot even with our very tiny digital team of two to create all sorts of new engagements that address the needs of um, children that address the needs of teens, that address the needs of young adults, of people, adults like ourselves who care about art and love art, uh, people with disabilities, seniors, they're all these different targeted audiences. And so we're trying to come up with new online uh, opportunities to really engage people. And I think that that's not going to be and I know that that's not going to be an effort that starts with the pandemic and then ends once we reopen. It's going to be a constant new um, kind of effort throughout the institution's work, a more serious effort than it has been even in the past as we try to engage audiences uh, locally as well as from around the globe who may not have the benefit of uh, you know, seeing our collections and benefiting from the ethos that is unique to the Brooklyn Museum. Yeah, and, and I have to say, just as a personal bias, as someone who has less than 5% vision, uh, I like objects. <laughs> uh, I have difficulty with illuminated screens. I, I can't see what's going on. Uh, and, you know, that's just me and people like me, uh, yeah. a small percentage. But there's something real about uh, having sound passing through a physical object and not an amplifier. You know, something about touching uh, and, and, and feeling the physical presence of something, even if you're not touching it, you know. You know, th thank you for that, Chris. And also we have to remember that even though we have social hesitation until there's a vaccine or there's medicines to help, you know, lessen the, the risk of COVID, people are social creatures. They want to experience things together. There's the, you know, yeah. FOMO for a reason. People want to get together and have these experiences. And I don't think that ends. It's, it's in our DNA. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree. And that is what empathy is. It's feeling what someone else is feeling. And in order to do that, there has to be someone else there. Yeah. You know? um, so I, I'd like to move on to um, uh, the, the, the third musketeer in our artistic endeavor, uh, uh, Mona. And uh, I, I guess I just want to start a little bit of, about, uh, uh, you know, your journey in terms of data visualization and, and coming up with uh, ways of making the data come alive for people. Um, in terms of this 
COVID epidemic. We've seen not only an epidemic of a virus, but an epidemic of confusion and misinformation. Uh, what role do you see yourself playing and artists uh, of trying to, to grapple uh, uh, with this? Uh, when we have a new, new situation and we're filled with our brains often impose patterns and orders and answers which may not actually be there yet because we don't have the evidence. Um, how, how, how do you grapple with uh, uh, a situation like we're dealing with now? Yeah. Um, it's really tough. Also, I'll just say, sorry, I disappeared for a second. My internet connection went backing up my previous point, I guess, about um, access, maybe. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I feel a real responsibility right now to inform. I remember what feels like a million years ago at the beginning of this pandemic, um, speaking to friends who didn't see it as an urgent problem. And that you, you know that feeling of like desperately trying to convince someone of something and then thinking about my role, both as a journalist, but as an artist. Um, Chris, you were talking earlier about this idea of sense making, but also em the emotional resonance of work. So m my goal is to inform people without terrifying them, um, but often with a deliberate attempt, I guess, to provoke some kind of emotional response. You asked earlier for me to share a few pieces. Shall I, shall I do that now and share some examples of some of the work? Oh, please, yes. Great. Okay, I'm sure there'll be some. But you'll, you'll have to describe them because I, I won't be able to see them. So, so show them to the folks that they can see them, but also if you could verbally describe them for me. And I apologize, Chris, I have created um, charts and illustrations specifically for people with um, visual impairments before, but I haven't done just yet for COVID, which I think is a failing on my part. Um, but I will try to create more of them um, moving forward. So I'm sure- I forgive you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm sure there'll be some other technical problem that will arise, but here we go. Let me know if you can see this first one right here. Um, so this, can you walk me through it? Yeah, of course. So this first one um, was about a study that was talking about incubation rates of COVID. So what it, what it was looking at was how long it takes for um, people who have been infected to show symptoms. And so um, I use color to try to show um, the percentage of people who show, who show symptoms on any given day. So in the first few days, basically 0% of people are showing symptoms. And by the 14th day, pretty much everyone is. But you see a real shift happen around about day six, day seven, which is when around 50% of people start to show symptoms around about that point. And what was really fantastic about this particular illustration um, was that one of the researchers who authored the study's friends saw the post on Instagram, shared it with their friend who was the author of the study, and the author wrote to me, um, and obviously I was petrified that I had done a bad job of illustrating it, but they said that they were very grateful for these, these small little footnotes that are so easy to miss. So um, this footnote at the end that says, we don't actually reach 100% at day 14 because not everyone will show symptoms. Um, so I'm gonna walk through just a couple of other ones. Um, this one was quite successful right at the beginning of the outbreak, which was showing the symptoms. And this was based on data from the World Health Organization um, that looked at 56,000 lab cases and the different symptoms that people showed. So you can see that the vast majority of symptoms are fever, um, a dry cough, fatigue, and then um, you go down the list with um, symptoms that are less and less frequent, including diarrhea, the illustration for which provoked some concern among people. <laughs> um, and actually, as with all of these illustrations, I feel like what's difficult is that the illustrations almost need to be live and dynamic and change as our scientific understanding changes. So at the time that I, at the time that I created this, loss of um, smell and taste wasn't one of the known symptoms that's emerged afterwards. And also we didn't have any sense whatsoever of the share of people that are asymptomatic. And I think if I were to remake this now, and I probably should, um, I would add both of those in. Uh, I don't want to talk for too long. I'll, I'll mention um, maybe one other, possibly two others. This one was one that I think I actually messed up on. Um, it was talking about something that I think everyone is thinking about a lot, which is how long the virus lives on different surfaces. And at the time I had a choice between two different sources. I had a study that had just come out in um, any JM that maybe, you, maybe you're familiar with that hadn't been peer reviewed at the time. And it found that the virus can only live for a couple of days on different surfaces. And then I found this older study that looked at different kinds of coronavirus. So it looked at SARS and MERS 
and found much longer survival rates. And I think one of the problems with data visualization in general is that it's not very good at showing uncertainty. So we, we present computer generated graphics, um, present the facts as if they are this perfectly neutral, objective, impenetrable truth. And I think one of the things that I try to do by creating hand-drawn illustrations is to, I can stop sharing now, um, is, to, is to explain to people that um, a human was responsible for collecting this data, a human with their own biases, even the best data that we have, um, and to keep that in mind when they're consuming the information. And also by using these shaky lines and by not showing numbers to decimal places and trying to admit some of the uncertainty that we have, but by admitting that uncertainty and hopefully by showing that humility, it also says this is the bounds of our knowledge. And yes, we're unsure whether it's here or here, but we know it's somewhere within this universe. And to say that it's way off here just isn't true. Um, so, yeah, I think that was one of my attempts to show uncertainty. And I'm constantly thinking about different visual techniques I can I can use for that and sound techniques as well um, to make sure that people who are visually impaired can also um, have access to the information. Go ahead, Jerry. I'm curious I, to what Jerry thinks. <laughs> uh, I love these. They should be everywhere. But is it hard to come across the most recent information? Does WHO uh, provide some of that or UN or is this easily accessible or do you have to crisscross all mm -hmm. over for weeks to get this? That's a great question. I think it completely depends on the topic that I'm covering at any given time in terms of the accessibility of information. So, for example, unemployment data, I always know I go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics job done. When it comes to COVID, it is really, really difficult. Like I have a bit of a background in research, so I understand a little bit how to sift through the different studies. I, I know um, things, for example, like the number of participants, there are certain clues that I'm looking for in terms of study reliability. But to know that I can go to the World Health Organization and there are people with 50 million times better expertise than me who have said, this is a solid study, really, really helps me in terms of doing my work. But the other thing that you raised, which I think is really important and it's actually really exciting about um, art in general and also data journalism is the opportunity to take people on a journey with you so rather than just saying to them, this study is reliable, take my word for it, trust me, this is good information. What I try to do very often in my stories, and I see artists doing this all the time in terms of sharing their techniques, is saying, these are the Google search terms that I used. This was the first study that I found. I discredited it for these reasons. Instead, I went to this study. I looked at figure one, figure two, figure three. Figure three is the really interesting one that shows the racial dynamics in this. Here's what the original chart looks like. Here's what the data behind the chart looks like. Here's what it looks like when it's adjusted for population. So it's like maths allows you to, to do that, to, to break down every single step of the process in the exact same way that art does. And what's exciting about that is I think there's a real opportunity now to change people's relationship, not just to um, information sources that come from different places, but even their relationship to mathematics, right? Like I speak to people all the time who are just like, oh no, it's not for me, I'm too stupid, I don't get the numbers. And actually now people are talking to me about log scales, they're talking about methodologies because their, I think their patience with staying with the screen has changed because they realize they absolutely have to understand this. And there's an opportunity in that to, to change people's emotional relationship with maths and say, it doesn't have to be scary. If I can understand this, then I promise you, you can as well. Well, I, I think what you're saying is absolutely brilliant and spot on. Uh, and, and also what you were saying earlier about um, ambiguity and trying to capture that, because it is true uh, that people love easy answers. They want you know, black and white solutions, yes or no. And unfortunately, um, public health doesn't work that way. It works in percentages and probabilities, you know, not yes or no's. Uh, so for instance, when seatbelts were introduced in the late 60s, um, traffic deaths reduced dramatically by upwards of 60%, you know, thousands and thousands of people lived that would have died, but it wasn't 100%. You know, mm. was it a failure? You know, uh, a vaccine comes out and, uh, you know, has 1% adverse reaction. Is that a failure? You know, uh, and so it, it's hard for people to put these things into perspective and being able to, as you say, illustrate 
the math in a human way, um, I, I, th I think is very helpful because we fall into these mental traps. You know? and, and I think there's a very important example of that now, which is that November isn't very, very far away. And I think there has always been such a focus on polling and like, tell us what is going to happen in 30 days from now. That's not how electoral politics work. It's actually also not good for democracy to predict who everyone's gonna vote for before people have had an opportunity to go out and cast their vote. We have to think about how the communication of numbers can actually shape people's behavior. And I think this pandemic has really, really shown that. If you say to people, this is who's gonna win, how does that affect people's vote and behavior? So I'm always thinking about, and maybe it's too, um, egotistical narcissistic of me and I don't actually wield any power whatsoever I think that's quite possible but I'm always thinking how does me putting this out here potentially affects people's behavior and people's public health if they misinterpret what I'm saying if they take to heart too much what I'm saying um, I think we have to think about what happens when the work lives in the world after you finish doing your part if that makes sense Oh yeah, yeah, and and I, I think one of the things that we struggle with uh, at evidence-based organizations like WHO is that when we're in a crisis situation, uh, when the anxiety is the highest, the actual information is at the lowest, you know, and uh, and the WHO and other similar organizations are constrained by the fact that we can only talk about things once we have evidence, and that takes time. Uh, so a lot of the critical answers that people need just simply aren't available yet. You know, what we, we can we can talk about what we know. We can use examples of similar things in the past, and but you know uh, th those ambiguities are are very hard to explain, especially when the stakes are so high and the anxieties are so high. You know, um, uh, and at the same time, you know, being you know, we, we have to be that way. We have to discipline ourselves so that when we do speak, it has the authority of evidence, you know, that we can speak with confidence. Uh, here are our guidelines, these work, you know, uh, but if we're just guessing, you know, if we're making reasonable assumptions, you know, then, then we lose that authority, you know, and it, it's a struggle, yeah. you know, I have to say. Yeah, um, a question came in uh, for you, Mona, um, uh, and it, it's it's similar to uh, what Anne was talking about earlier, uh, but uh, perhaps you can uh, talk about it from your perspective, and and that's um, <clears throat> how can more minority artists who are struggling financially be part of the institutional art world during and in the aftermath of the pandemic. It's a really, really difficult question. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't promise you easy questions. <laughs> um, I think it, maybe there's a parallel with what I was saying about our emotional relationship with math. So I would say growing up, my emotional relationship with the art world was that it was a place where I didn't belong. I felt alienated from it. And I think for quite, um, it wasn't just a paranoia for quite legitimate reasons. I would say that, um, speaking from experience I think it's helpful with minority artists um I kind of hate the expression minority artists because uh globally I guess we're not the minority um but uh, all artists are a minority <laughs> um that's true <laughs> um if uh they try to set aside that emotional relationship with some of those institutions and almost like act as if they belong there when, when they show up, which I think can be quite powerful, but also to, um, I don't know, I, just, I don't know whether my own path is, is a helpful one to describe. I felt incredibly frustrated in a job that I was in. I felt very, very um, uh, different, I guess, and like I didn't fit in. And one of the ways that I was able to build up my confidence was from just posting on Instagram. And I don't know how, how replicable that is as a model because Instagram has changed so much since then. I mentioned on our, on our uh, I mentioned on a previous call that actually Jerry Source was very integral to my growth on Instagram. I think I had 150 followers at the time. I had no idea how he even found one of my illustrations, a very provocative one on male circumcision rates. Um, and he shared it and it was really, really helpful to me to help to grow that um, platform. Yeah, I'm really, really sorry. The only thing that I, I would like to say 
I don't know how helpful this is, is to refuse as much as possible to work for free. Because I think that's such a dangerous trap that so many of us have been pulled down. I created an illustration a while ago, which is actually putting the onus on people who ask people to work for free. So it's the, the quiz is, should you ask an artist to work for free? And the questions you need to ask yourself are whether you're working for a nonprofit, if you're working in the for-profit world, don't even think about it. And even if you work in a nonprofit, are you, are you creating work that directly privileges people with even less power than the artists that you're asking to work for free? So figuring out all of that stuff. And I think the more of us that say no to, to honest, honestly disrespectful requests from for profits to work for free, the more that we can kind of collectively mobilize to denormalize free artist work. I'm sorry, this is a very- Your Honor. Mona, it's Anne. I, can I jump in for a second? Please, uh, please. Because Mona, I think that, thank you. I always, when uh, corporations come to me and think that artists should do something for free because it'll give them more visibility, I'm like, I hang up the phone. So, <laughs> so but I, I do want to say to artists that this is not a good time to send people like me and Jerry emails saying, come look at my work. Have you looked at my work? I didn't hear from you, it was three days ago. Have you looked at my work yet? I will never speak to you again. Like it's just the wrong time. Mm -hmm. Create some meaning in the world. You want attention? Use your skills to help out in this moment. Share what you're doing on your social media platforms. And if it's really awesome, chances are some of us are gonna become aware of it and we'll reach out to you if it applies to the work that we're doing. This is not a time period for selfishness. This is a time period for all of us for selflessness. So get busy, get involved. I'm seeing a bunch of artists, you know, making prints, selling them like, you know, cause uh, to benefit our local hospitals in Brooklyn, which have been hit very, very hard. Makes me love the guy even more than I already do. So, you know, do things that are gonna be meaningful for your community and use your skills for good. And if you have a skill that's gonna be useful for your local institution, let them know about it. I think that's, I just want to add one last point because that's so smart and everything that you just said, sorry, Jerry, I just bumped ahead of you. In addition to social media, if you have access to windows, that's like a really incredible physical space where you're able to share some of your work in your community and is another possible way to get your work out there. Sorry, Jerry. No, I just love what you're all saying. And I guess what I think too is the art world we just left was making the first time massive steps on the part of uh, the museums, the artists, obviously, many writers. The commercial galleries were lagging behind, but the market was not, that we were undoing the canon, that for the first time, we were uh, uh, getting numbers like 51% of the population is women, and so it made perfect sense that a, about that percent should be represented in museums. Artists of color from everywhere were starting to get in, into all of these institutions that had spent the last 50,000 years, you know, just showing me. And when we come back, that work will be continued, but the canon much of which is tremendous, just tremendous forms. The canon is being rewritten. You are going to re, really, really rewrite the canon and you won't take no for an answer. The problem, one last thing, is I don't want to undo myself. Here is a problem for old white geezers where I know as a white male, I'm, I should undo myself. I've quit teaching jobs to let other people have room, uh, given writing jobs to other people, but this is my work. I don't have another way to live and I'm complaining about nothing. I love my life, but it's hard to think about, gee whiz, I too should step down, but uh, I should never have ended this point just here. But anyway, Jerry, yeah. Jerry, I'll help you out. And I'll say that, um, that it is uh, very important for all of us to make room and welcome others in uh, with, with grace and humility and with real opportunity. Um, and I think um, our institutions 
um, not only have a threat based on our financial realities right now, right? We also have a threat based on our relevance. If we don't blow open the cannon, if we don't really include others in everything that we do, we're no longer relevant. So time for institutions to get with the program at long last. And speaking of getting with the program, it is Earth Day, you guys. We should be talking about climate and what our field is or is not doing in terms of uh, you know, our 10 year window at best of, of, of uh, saving humanity. Well, let's talk can... about that for a moment. Okay. I was an art critic before I let Anne really get on with that important business. It's we must never ever let it become normal again to fly from New York to London for a night at an art fair or a museum or an auction or anything. I'm sorry. Maybe it was sexy and fun. I was envious of everybody, but that is that must never be thought of as normal again. Ditto all the back to back to back to back art fairs, event culture, biennials, that really, when are you going to get on an airplane next and start flying that way? And is just opening the door to this, right? What else? Yeah. What else I mean, are Jerry, we going to do? Yeah, Jerry, I mean, that's, that's a perfect point. I mean, one of the silver linings to this situation is I can easily ban all travel for myself and my staff for the next year and feel good about it, not mm -hmm. only because of health reasons, but because um, it's better for the environment. Uh, I, I don't care as much that it's bad for the airlines. Um, I care about these larger issues. And I think that as a field, let's just take museums, for example, we have uh, been inconsistent at best in terms of our awareness and commitment to doing something about climate crisis. I mean, just take a look at all the constant expansion, 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 expansion of our institutions. Even museums that may only be 10 or 20 years old get ripped down and new ones get built. And, you know, I'm not saying that all of that is bad, but I think it's going to have to force donors, boards, leaders to really think this constant, uh, you know, death destruction of materials. And I think there are small things we can all be doing, um, you know, in addition to constantly having exhibitions that deal with uh, issues of climate. And by the way, Chris, you, you thought we had a medical exhibition? We didn't. We have an exhibition that takes a look at climate devastation and its impact on indigenous communities. And I think that's what uh, uh, with you. Uh, it's called Climate in Crisis. It. Uh, but, you know, I think we need to do consistent exhibitions, ex consistent educational programs, consistent public programs, and we need to look at our own green footprint. And I confess that it was just this year that my team rallied with me and created a volunteer task force, our green team, to help reduce our plastics and, you know, our use of paper and, you know, all sorts of things. We're going to LEDs finally as an institution, but our whole field must be do much more. So Jerry, thank you for mentioning that. Well, and in fact, uh, I, I would say that one of the illusions that this virus has ripped away, uh, one of the positive benefits uh, amongst the negative ones um, is this illusion that we can do whatever we want to with the environment without any consequence. Mm -hmm. And um, in, during this travel ban, as painful as it's been, I'm here in Geneva and you know the sky has cleared you know the, the the air quality across the world is improving in just a matter of weeks uh, so it does make you wonder if um, again this isn't just a warning signal but also a signal for the the positive path ahead you know the what, what we could be doing to make our lives uh, more healthy, more sustainable, and more, I, I wouldn't even say in balance with, with the environment. We are part of the environment, you know? Let's not keep fouling our own nest, you know? Chris, a lot of people are, and artists in particular that I know of, are talking about the, the connection to climate crisis and COVID. And I think for a lot of audiences, that connection is not so clear. Would you feel comfortable 
talking a little bit more about that? Mm. Well, I, I, I tried to cover it a little bit in uh, my uh, you know, introduction at the beginning, but uh, I, I think that um, in general, um, you know, the, the climate change is affecting our health in many ways. I, I talked a little bit about uh, diseases like COVID that probably came from the animal kingdom. Um, Ebola was another one. Um, although we don't know which animal Ebola hopped from in West Africa, it's uh, possible it was an African bat. We do know that because of deforestation, those bats moved into West Africa in areas that they hadn't been before. So that is one theory. Um, but it, it's, it's other things as well. It's um, the range of mosquito-borne illnesses is slowly moving northward because of climate change. And historically, throughout all of human history, the one animal that's been most deadly to man is the mosquito. You know, and and that that range, whether you're talking about Zika or, or yellow fever or malaria, that range is increasing. You know, so uh, th these are these are all elements. Um, the availability of water, uh, the the sustainability of our agricultural practices, these are all related to climate change. Um, and uh, our, you know, I I I I think that. We have to stop thinking in terms of yes or no, zero sum equations and look at the complex systems and, and start realizing that we can take this negative cycle and turn it into a virtuous cycle through very simple behavior changes. You know, uh, and, and now's the time. I, uh, we have literally a 10 year window before it becomes irreversible. Um, my sons um, talk about not having children because they wonder whether this planet is going to be habitable you know, in future generations. And I'd like to be able to tell them with confidence, don't worry, love one another, have children, because we're taking the steps to learn from our mistakes and do the right thing. But I can't say that sincerely yet because we're not, right. you know, and, and, and so that I think part of the artist's responsibility is to help amplify that message uh, in whatever way we can. You know, um, I, I, I think it's time to maybe on that note, um, there's one question I'd like to ask all of you, and then I wanna get into some of the specific questions that are coming in from uh, the YouTube uh, comment section. Um, but, but one question, uh, and, and perhaps this was one of them that we just said, but we do know that this talk is going to be written up. It's going to be presented to world leaders uh, as an input uh, from, you know, we small unrepresentative members of the artistic community uh, for them to consider uh, in, in their policy discussions moving forward. If you could choose one thing to say to the UN, to world leaders about the future, you know, from a policy point of view, what would that be? And uh, why don't we begin with Mona? Um. Mine feels quite wonky, um, but I think it's potentially quite important is, um, I think averages breed distrust. And I think most of the numbers that we've presented are presented as averages without breaking down who is affected by something, the disproportionate impact of all kinds of things, whether it's um, environmental degradation or this pandemic. And I think the more that policymakers can um, talk in non-aggregate terms and break down those averages, the more that they will foster the public's trust in the information that they're sharing. But that feels quite nerdy, but it's something I'm thinking about right now. I have no problem with wonky questions. I'm an I'm a incurable wonk myself. Um, Jerry. I would say to everyone that culture is the soul of your country, the spirit of your culture is every generation that came before you. 
and that you are merely a caretaker, a shepherd of it, a conductor, a channeler of it, that is, as I said, no more or no less important than philosophy, religion, psychology. It's just part of the whole ball of wax. And we don't understand it, but we don't understand Mozart either. But we just know we might not want to live without it. Amen to that. Uh, Anne. Um, so some people on my team are talking about, and I think people in the art world internationally are talking about a kind of new New Deal. And the New Deal post-World War um, looked at the big picture issues in the United States um, about equity and access. It provided electricity throughout the country. It put artists at work in terms of glorifying buildings, et cetera. Uh, and I think it's time to look at a new kind of New Deal, one that takes uh, a look at certainly what infrastructure changes we need in terms of climate, how we can put people back at work, how can creative people be involved in this, and, and take a look at systemic systems that have kept uh, people on the fringes, on the margins, and address those issues uh, at long last. And so, you know, whether it's uh, prisons and, uh, you know, the ills of mass incarceration and, you know, a whole bunch of other, other things, immigration in this country, um, and get it right. So I think it's time some, for some big visionary uh, thinking in this country, in the United States, but uh, wouldn't it be something marvelous if world leaders joined together in some kind of new, new deal? I, I am very inspired by that. And in fact, it's very much related to what I would say uh, to the policymakers. Uh, I would say health is often look like, looked at as an expense. It is not, it is an investment. You know, it's been proven over and over again when you invest in health for all, the benefits you receive are manifold in terms of economic prosperity. Uh, across the board. Uh, but I would also argue that arts funding is often considered an afterthought, a nice to have, you know, when there are other things. And, uh, I would argue that WHO has proven that art as an investment is one of the soundest investments that a, a, a society can make in improving well being, uh, as defined in not just physical health but also mental health and social health. You know, and all of these things are part of WHO's definition of, of health. You know, and, uh, and, and so that would be my suggestion to policymakers is um, maybe a few fewer bombs out there and a few more schools, more uh, strengthening of health systems, uh, some testing kits to avoid the situation and avoid lockdowns in the future um, and, and invest in the artists, you know? Uh, and yep. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I'm gonna read a few questions from uh, our live audience and I would like to encourage them to keep writing uh, in the comments questions. Um, some of these questions are addressed to individuals but I think all of you can of course uh, chime in if you have something to say. Here's a question to Anne from Mohammed Wadden. What about initiatives by institutes like the Museum of the City of New York's call to collect the stories on the current situation? Is it too early to think of collection? What's um, Brooklyn Museum's curatorial view on that? Uh, no, it's not too early. And uh, in fact, Mohammed, we are thinking about the ways in which the museum will respond programmatically. Uh, and already we have been working with our board and our curatorial team on focusing our collection uh, uh, purchases for the future around specific themes. Uh, if you wanna, you know, if you have limited acquisition dollars as we do, and you really want to be known for putting together a collection that speaks powerfully to our times so that people decades from now, generations from now, can come back to the Brooklyn Museum and understand what was happening in 2020. Um, you know, certainly climate, for example, is one of the most, if not the most important theme that we might engage in, social inequities in our country, another one, mass migrations, um, 
uh, related to war and uh, you know global capital, uh, maybe another one. So we are thinking along those lines for now and for prosperity. And uh, here, here's a, uh, another question for you, Anne, but again, anyone else can uh, chime in. Um, this is a question from Jan uh, Hanvik. What do you think about the importance of indigenous knowledge and voices from indigenous communities? Uh, Jan, just to put some context, works with indigenous groups in Mexico, adapting their e ecology parks into artist residencies and arts environment uh, conference centers. Uh, Jan, thank you for the work that you do and thank you for that question. I think again, institutions have been, like ours, have been um, awful at dealing with embracing, inviting in, listening, uh, uh, partnering with indigenous peoples. Uh, we've started to make a change at the Brooklyn Museum over the past few years. Uh, for example, uh, you know, a number of indigenous people were involved in shaping our climate and crisis exhibition. Uh, we have a wonderful exhibition. I can't wait for it to be reopened with Jeffrey Gibson and rethinking narratives around Native American people in particular. Uh, we've uh, vi invited in this year a conference of all the Lenape leaders to talk about uh, what the museum can be doing and should be doing in terms of honoring uh, Lenape history and present day and future generations. So I think there's a lot more that our field must do. And I think that when we're looking at medicines and health and science, we're seeing articles all the time um, about how our indigenous uh, 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 peoples have known how to care for our land and take care of people in ways that have been disregarded it, with uh, modern contemporary medicine. Uh, great, here's a question to Jerry um, from Muhammad again. How have catastrophes shaped moments of transformation in art history? And what do you think might come out of this moment in terms of artistic production? Mohammed, that's a very key question. Christopher Bailey, who is with us, has talked a lot about, and I'd actually like him to take this question after I give a little bit of a answer about what catastrophe brings. The world does change, and then some things don't. What is changing are the systems that all of this will be delivered by. You heard the head of a major world museum just now say off the cuff, we've been bad at this. That is a, a gigantic breakthrough. It means that war is won that most of the people at these museums already know it's a, a change has already come. Styles will change, space will change. We may stay the same. May, we may not put aside childish things, but we will recognize it when we see it. But I want Mohammed Christopher to unpack what the word that you use too, catastrophe means. Would you mind that, Christopher? You told me about it yeah, maybe, and it was beautiful. Sure, maybe, <clears throat> maybe briefly. Uh, I, I have a performance piece that I do which describes my journey into blindness and how it changed things like uh, my, well, obviously my perception, but my, my understanding of the world and, um, and, and my engagement with it. And my background is the theater. And the ancient Greeks um, had a very specific definition of the word catastrophe, which was different than a disaster. A disaster is something that happens outside of your um, control. And, uh, and when it happens, there's not much you can do about it, you know, too bad, you know. A catastrophe literally means an overturning, you know, and the, the difference is not so much the event itself, but the meaning that we put on it. You know, um, when a catastrophe happens, um, a person's state changes, you know, suddenly in the COVID catastrophe, um, world leaders are powerless. And we are entirely dependent upon grocery store clerks. 
there's been an overturning of the social structure. You know, um, suddenly these things that we worried so much about, um, uh, the, the, the air is clear, you know. Um, and, and in my own case, uh, uh, w when I found myself moving into blindness, I, it was like a death to me. It was, it was a death of the way I experienced the world. And I went through all of the stages uh, of grieving uh, and anger and denial and bargaining. Um, but I also reached a stage where I came out of it. And as a catastrophe, I found a meaning in it where I embraced my blindness and I began to voluntarily embrace this world of darkness and not resent it. Just as you willingly closed your eyes to savor a glass of wine, just as you willingly closed your eyes to better embody and listen to a piece of music, just as you willingly closed your eyes to trace the gentle slope of a lover's forearm, so too do I close my eyes to better live this moment with you. That is a catastrophe. My God. The overturning. That Mohammed, was beautiful, beautiful, you've Christian. heard from a mountain. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, we, we've actually run out of time here. I have to uh, begin uh, the segue into our next uh, uh, segment. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a video of something called Letters from the Earth. And it's, it's a project uh, where we're celebrating uh, the year anniversary, last Earth Day of the, the US publication of 50 letters from people around the world writing to the Earth, um, expressing their feelings about what's happening to the Earth and, uh, and, and, and what could be done to save it, to cherish it, to, to nurture it. Um, and, and this project is an ongoing project. So go to lettersoftheearth.com and have a look at uh, these letters themselves and the videos, and you'll be seeing uh, some videos in a few minutes. Um, but also um, uh, continue to write your own letters, uh, send them into the group uh, and, and, and be part of the celebration that isn't just one day out of the year, it's every day, it's every waking moment. Uh, I've been asked to, in a live presentation, uh, read a letter to the earth. Uh, I, I, I can't read very well, so I'm gonna have to do it ex tempore. Um, uh, so, um, and I, I'll, so I'll, 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 I'll just improvise my letter to the earth. Um, uh, I'll, I'll use a prop. Uh, this is my um, stick that I use to navigate around, uh, which many visually and blind, visually impaired and blind people use, but uh, I'll, I'll use that. Um, my dear Earth, my name is Christopher Bailey. I'm the arts and health lead at the World Health Organization. And you may recognize yourself in our UN logo uh, which I proudly wear on my chest. Um, one of the things you may not realize about the WHO logo is that it not only has the globe, such as the UN, but in front of it is a rod with a snake crawling around it. Uh, this is the symbol of medicine. But what you may not realize is where this symbol comes from. It comes from ancient Greek mythology, where Asclepius, the, according to legend, the first doctor, the way he would treat his patients is he would, he would come up to the patient in front of him, he would observe them, he would listen to them, and then he would take his rod and place it in front of the patient into the ground, and a snake would crawl up from the ground, wrap around the rod, and whisper in his ear the secrets of the earth, which would give him the information he would need, thank you, would give him the information he would need to cure that patient. Now, I love this story for two reasons. The first reason is he got his information from the cold, hard reality of the earth, not the empty 
fantasy of the sky. In other words, evidence. The second reason I like this story is that his power wasn't his ability to speak or his intelligence. His power was his ability to listen, to listen to the patient and to listen to the earth. And I would like to hope that you, Mother Earth, through this COVID pandemic, are whispering to us your secrets, that this glorious day that I see right outside here in Geneva is a message to us, a message that like Asclepius, I hope we are wise enough to hear, to listen, to understand, and to act on while we have time so that we could take that information from you, the earth, and begin to heal ourselves. With greatest affection, cordially yours, Christopher Bailey. And now, oh, thank you. Now <laughs> let's run uh, the videotape. Thank you to all our guests. Thank you so much. Our joy. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Happy and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being. And we're still. And they listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced. the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. To those who have left footprints on the midnight sidewalks, time has stopped for many, but not for some. Time has stopped for us who have a home, for those who have paper towels in the cupboard, for those who have peace of bleeding earth. Time has stopped for us who can only know how to travel by plane, for those who can stay behind a blue green glowing screen for those who can bring a plant indoors and call it a garden. Time has stopped for us who don't know the winding hospital corridors, the pace of footsteps necessary to leap over the crack that determines breath. Time has stopped for us who don't need to lock the door behind us every morning, questions dirt under our fingernails. Time has stopped for us who don't feel bone-weary, bone-aching, bone-breaking exhaustion that comes from holding the whole world on our shoulders. Time goes on. Time continues. And we are grateful to and in debt to and owe all of ourselves to the royalty whose hands turn red from cleaning each shopping cart to the kings and queens who leave with the breaking of the sky and return with it clicking shut. To those who are essential. To those who keep running and upholding and working when our government have failed them, mixing essential with sacrificial over and over and over again. To those who love love beyond anything we had known before, 
whose love is strong enough to keep us home, is fast enough to keep us moving forward, is close enough to keep us bound together with care, so tight that a knife couldn't cut through it. Thank you. Dear Earth, flowers have blossomed and the weather has changed, but why doesn't it feel like it? Lonely. This is the word to describe the fact of this unfortunate event that has occurred over the past few weeks. The whole world is asleep and it is so quiet that the sun is bored of chasing the clouds. Usually, quiet means peaceful, peaceful. But in this time of fear and anxiety, it's quite the opposite. How does it feel like knowing that this of meeting my friends again, uncertain of going to my family holiday in summer, uncertain of everything happening in the world. When I wake and sit in the morning silence, I take my moment to breathe. I've forgotten how to breathe before this silence. I've spent years holding my breath whilst running to keep up. I've not stopped running, moving through the world without looking, taking from the world what I need to get through, getting lost in a future that's yet to come, confused by the chaos. Stop. I breathe. I've forgotten the direction I was going in when I began. Breathe again. There is time to stop, to think, to listen. I feel the stillness returning and I see the world once more. A world that's been ignored. I will never forget how to breathe again. Love letter to breath. Tingling. There's always tingling when lovers meet. Here, between my upper lip and nostrils. And now my chin. Like the excavation of a dimple. And my right eyebrow, of all things. I'm aware of how much my nostrils flare. About the size of pound coins doesn't bother me. Everything opens. My throat. The space. Down. Down through my legs and into the earth and back again. You endow me with love for the whole wide world. How precious you are. Breath. What do you want to leave behind? Alyssa from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Always in a rush, I am a highly strung worry warrior with the background anxiety levels of Trump's hair on a windy day. So one of the unexpected upsides of lockdown is that it forced me to slow the fuck down and ask, what do you want to be when this is all over? When the field of our experience narrows, it brings into sharp focus the type of person we are. Are you a keep calm and carry honour? or an awake at 3am catastrophizer, a buy what you need or a toilet paper hoarder. I see just how much of my energy is devoted to worrying about the future. My head reads like a stock exchange ticker of the world's woes, 
pandemic, climate change, biodiversity collapse. What will happen to the Navarro cheer team now Daytona is cancelled? This time is my opportunity to become less of a small stuff sweater and more of a present moment dweller. What do we want to leave behind? And what do we want to take with us into this brave new world we'll have to create? Easter Sunday, 2020. Dear mother, I'm writing to you in the garden. We're all locked down and I'm sitting in it. This is what I'm doing today. Listening to three priests on the radio, talking about the resurrection and laughing, to the children beyond the fence, playing next door, laughing too. Above me, a branch bounces. Two blue tits are on the branch. The branch is spindle thin, but does not snap. The leaves on the branch are emerald green. Newborn, they flutter. The blue tits zoom away on invisible roller coasters. A white flower spins out of a bush. Why? crackles, then echoes like an empty hall. Is this the end, Mother? I'm sorry. I've been asking this so often. I'm sorry it has taken all this for us to hear. Say, forgive us, Mother. And after the thunder, a bellow and whoosh of leaves blows into our eyes, my wife and I, and all we can do is close our eyes and wait till the whoosh is gone and the dust settles who knows if it will and if it does what will remain but at least i wondered and heard the robins whir, the swans honk the bounce of the blue tits at least i marveled at my wife's wish wish wishing i marveled at my wife and my children and my grandchildren and the children next door laughing like bells in the morning. A splash of rain drops on my hand, my face, my book, like light. Be well, be happy. There's this quiet whisper in my heart. Be well. Be happy. I only hear it late at night, breathing out in this newfound familiar strangeness. Or I hear it as I end a Skype or a Zoom or a FaceTime with a stab of missing the person I've only just seen and heard, not touched. Or watching the news, which is hard to turn off. Be well, be happy. Far-flung friends and family, once met workmates, long lost loves, Nurses, with only a plastic apron between them and their fevered patients. Be well, be happy. I hear it in the chirping of the sparrows, the throaty call of the wood pigeon, the starling's love song at dusk, and the buzzing of the bee in the hibiscus, noisy in this much-silenced, used-to-be-bustling city. Be well, be happy, as we learn all these Clunky terms, shielding, social distancing, self-isolating, lockdown. They sound like words of war and times of peace. COVID-19 isn't the enemy. It too simply wants to reproduce itself. Be well, be happy. 
long ago grief slide back in. Yesterday is today again. Time and space are disorienting tricksters in these four walls, and I wake with tears rolling down my cheeks. Fabulously contagious love like a virus roams from New York to Colorado, from India to continental Europe, returning to Somerset, home, which may as well be a million miles away. Be well, be happy as the day breaks in this most heart-wrenching of exquisite springs, all is still at first, then the jolt and sudden remembrance that all is not right. The same jolt is at the start of a new day after the loss of a love, a love never forgotten. The jolt accommodated in the rings of our tree-like bodies. Be well, be happy as we face the fact of no return to normal. Normal was crisis, normal was inequality, normal was extinction, normal was oppression. But the normal was largely only named by those with no voice at the heart of the suffering. Be well, be happy. And this quiet, sometimes stillness, these voices, their whispers can finally be heard on the newly sweet blossom scented city air. Be well, be happy for hijacked cliches aside, we really are all in this together. As we survive and re-emerge, maybe with greater clarity and more compassion for the preciousness of this breath, your breath, mine, and the beating of the earth. We'll catch a glance of the invisible threads holding us together, keeping us alive. Be well, be happy. It's a whisper in my heart. It's all I've got. There are no loud, confident proclamations, no bells and whistles, no crystal ball reassurances. I keep whispering. Dear lungs everywhere, you are frontline workers. Our animal bodies wide and blurry borders with the world. Your web work is perhaps our most permeable surface, wet like a coast or a subterranean cave system. In each inhalation, you gather from our planet's sea of gases, the vital yet invisible elements of our survival, transforming air into self. Without you, we would only last minutes. And with each press, in and out, you uphold a life in constant dialogue with its surroundings. Yet the heart always steals the show. That close colleague's beat is understood as the sole rhythm driving our being. Dear lungs, you are not forgotten. We need you always, but especially now that we are threatened together. Dear lungs, my lungs, it feels like we're making progress. The restrictions have strangely released you. With the privilege of my working from home, we have time to run. When I am unrun fit, it takes the first kilometre or two to overcome the sharp, seizing, wheezing gasps as you, half-closed, are forced into deep, rib-stretching breaths. But now, three weeks in, the pain is gone. You feel fuller. And the air of quietened London has lost its taste of sulphur, its light colour of grease. In the parks, the pores of the leaves wink wider, a galaxy of stomata with their throats open to the spring. The breathing of this small suburb has deepened. Breathing space is enforced upon some, but elsewhere, never far, lungs are fighting tightening, their linings invaded, inflamed and furious, self-mutilating. They are drowning, infected, mechanically supported, some failing. Dear lungs everywhere, I imagine your vast acreages of pain. You could fan each pair of you out to the size of a tennis court. That fact always makes me think of the rainforest 
the lungs of our world and its destruction measured in football fields. I think of the thin and quickening gasps, the onset of a panic attack that no one hears unfold in its fullness, 17 floors up. The long sigh after the all-night warehouse shift, sinking back into the seat of an empty bus. The breaking breath of the daughter who cannot go into the ward to say goodbye. When I am stressed, I hold my breath, forgetting to release tension with the simplest and most natural movement, one that should not need to be actively remembered. Reading the news of 1,000 deaths a day, mass graves, military hospitals assembled in car parks, improvised morgues, domestic violence spiking, parliaments dissolving. I hold my breath. I think of breath quickening, thinning, halting. I think of breath grasping, faltering, stopping. I think of breath deepening, slowing, easing. In the silent flat, he paces, pushing his knuckles between his tight lips. Each human life begins and ends with a breath. The two brackets curve around each of us like a parenthesis, a story. Dear lungs everywhere, thank you.